All right, John, I wanted to talk now about easy characters hurting fighting games and four reasons why they basically should not be top tier. But first off, I want people to actually leave a comment below. We just asked them to leave a comment. Leave another comment on this video um, with their easy to play characters who are also top tier. I'm curious if there are any people like we haven't accounted for. We talk about, you know, Cami and Bison. We've done whole videos about this. But are there any characters we're missing that people feel like are, are particularly easy to play but are top tier and that are kind of like the problems here? Um, but again, speaking of the problems, people are immediately going to be like, okay, why is this such an issue, Catalyst? Why are you such a jerk? Why do you always talk about my characters this way? Well, guess what? Number one reason here that that um, easy character should not be top tier is it is bad game design. Developers can design all sorts of powerful techniques in fighting games, but usually the most powerful ones are locked behind some kind of execution wall or meter requirement. For example, Zangief's super and ultra moves tend to be extremely powerful. They grab you on frame one, they do a massive amount of damage, they're heavily invincible, and, and they might be outright broken if you give them to other characters. Mm -hmm. But to pull these off, you need to do a 720 motion, which is extremely difficult to do on the fly. Uh, you can't do it like a DP. You've got to really set it up, right? Uh, I that had is... so many blisters. I'm sorry, but this is really important. When I was a kid playing SF2 on uh, the SNES, trying to do Zangief uh, gra command grabs, which I never really got down as like a five or six year old or whatever, I had so many blisters trying to like mash those things out. It was so frustrating. And and so as you say that, it immediately took me back to those moments where it's like, this isn't even a thing. And it's like, a, obviously this is probably more of an arcade stick or at least a, 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 you know, a joystick on a controller kind of a thing. But I remember trying to do it on the D pad of an SNES controller and ugh, bad times. Yeah. And, and yet, uh, like Snake Eyes, who, you know, was a master of doing this, Van Geef and a bunch of others who were the masters of getting the 720s out in situations you did not think they could, they all played on pad. They figured it out with a pad, and it's like, ah, oh, but I had yeah, the same issues Yeah, but not a SNES pad. These are, yeah. like, they, they've been updated <laughs> since then. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, uh, so anyway, um, so with Zangief's move, you've also got to build up your meters with this and pick Zangief who traditionally has a very limited tool set in these games. It's not like, you know, Zangief has got a fireball and like an uppercut and a bunch of other things. Or he's got a handful hand. of... Yeah, he's... He... <laughs> poor, poor Zangief fans. Anyway, so so yes, it's a powerful technique. His, his, his command grab that's a 720 is a super powerful technique, but there are numerous hurdles you need to clear to use it properly. And generally, you know, Zangief is pretty well thought of in these games from a balanced perspective. He's very tried and true. It's uh, You rarely hear, hear people complain about Zangief uh, in these games. It's kind of like, yeah, he's, he's kind of is what he is. Now let's say, for example, that you remove the meter, the execution requirements from this move, and you make it a normal special that can be done with two buttons. All of a sudden, this move would dominate the entire game and the entire focus would be landing on it. The, the moment Zangief came out, it would just be bonkers. That's the risk you start running into when you design basic characters who are top tier. All these things that should be a factor in how strong a character is, like execution, the game's meta, uh, they get dialed back and you end up with a really unbalanced product. Um, other examples of this would be, you know, too powerful V triggers like Balrog in season two. You know, you you activated it and the round didn't start until Balrog popped his V trigger too, right? And it was not hard to do his setups in there. It's pretty much you you do the setups and they work, or you do the setups or not. It was it was too much reward for too little, um, too little, you know, uh, thought, effort, execution, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so basically the thing about this is like there are very tried and true things in fighting games and, and you if it's not coming down to execution and strategy and, and you're putting too much reward on this stuff, that's bad design. And we do not want bad design in these fighting games. It's proven over and over and over again. If you do this, like these characters are just going to be way too uh, plentiful. And that brings me to my next point. Uh, number two, it hurts diversity. We've seen this a ton in fighting games through the years, and Cammy and Bison are very obvious examples in Street Fighter V, and then you have someone like Bayonetta and Smash 4. When you make characters who are easy to play in top tier, why would you bother learning more complex fighters? You know, it's it's a very long-running theme in fighting games where if an easier-to-play character is top tier, the community is going to flock to them. They're, they're all going to be playing this character actually. And you look no further than our own uh, tournament statistics uh, stories that we run after, uh, you know, the majors and stuff, which will, you know, be showing up here. Um, you can see fighters appear way more often than others, some of them. Uh, and if you check into how difficult they are to play, you're going to see very consistent patterns in here. It's it's why we complain about, you know, uh, easy to play characters being top tier. It's like, well, guess what? They dominate the tournament circuit. And, you know, uh, it, we talked about this before, like Cammy's number one, at, I believe, the Grandmaster and Warlord rank. And it's because, you know, guess what? She's the easiest character to play in the game or among them. And she's really freaking strong.
right? Oh, and so that, it, your, it's... your Zangief example, where if Zangief could do an SBD just by pressing two buttons, so all he had to do was walk up and then press these buttons, um, and, and like people could get that that satisfaction that easily. It's like how many Zangiefs would there be, right? Like, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. sure, it, it it would be chaos. It would be crazy. And then like, yeah, you're right. Like the rest of the roster be damned. Yep. Yeah. So number three, it messes with risk and reward. Fighting game footsies are built on the fundamentals of uh, if, if a move is strong in the scenario, it needs to have several drawbacks in other scenarios. And the easiest way to explain this is with heavy attacks in Street Fighter. These moves typically have the longest reach and are the most powerful, but they also have the most recovery and are the most negative on block. Not in all cases, but in the majority of cases, that's how the, the heavies in this game work. Um, if there's no reasons to use your other buttons because the heavy attacks cover all options in our, all scenarios, You've messed with the game's risk and reward. It's like, well, I could hit other buttons, but why not just hit standing heavy punch? I play bison. Why not just hit heavy punch? And and that has been a problem. And if you look at like, you know, your average, and you can look up the stats on this too. If you look at, at a bison player's heavy punch usage, like how much they hit a heavy punch button versus how much other people do, you're going to see it's quite a bit more with that bison player. And it's like, well, why would I not hit this? You know, and yeah, so it, it's it's it really comes down to the staples easy button here. I mean, you could learn all the frame data. You could learn how to react to moves in a bunch of matchups, or I can just hit heavy punch. That I, yeah. the concept of risk and reward and balance. I think it, maybe it's better to say balance, but it, it, especially in fighting games, you're really thinking about it along the lines of risk and reward. That is at every layer of of the fighting game. It might be at every layer of life, but we don't need to get that philosophical. But you know, it, when it, you're talking maybe more about the character select screen, it's like why would I do this when I could do this? It's like the the risk reward is is if it's lopsided over here then I'm going to just go and, and, and do that. But ultimately that takes away from the experience because people don't like that. It's frustrating or it's too easy or, you know, and that's, those are evidences of an imbalance. But when things are right there, it's like one foot on either side and you're, and you're, you're right over the line and, and, and appropriately balanced with these things. It's much more fun. It's like this move has this much risk and this much reward to it. So I have to use it with this kind of balance in order to see fruit. Then when I see the fruit come out, when I've done the work and I've, and I've, he implemented it correctly it means something versus i can go up and press two buttons with zangief and win it's like great but that there's not a lot of meaning that comes out of that and it's a lot of frustration on the other side because of the imbalance and such so um i think it happens at the character select screen it happens you know with individual moves it happens with kind of general character designs um it happens with games but uh you know if you can say the risk reward is balanced on any certain level i think you're doing things right and it's a good barometer to use to check yourself literally you stole the words out of my mouth number four the oh, point uh is it's it's not fun uh legitimately it's not fun to do this stuff you li you literally had all this stuff i i had written down that you didn't know about and you said it all for me so I'm there's gonna your go next and wrap up. john said it better than i could and all that stuff it's just not fun to do it so again i so those are the, the top four points but i want to be clear here that more straightforward characters um, are not only perfectly fine to have in these games, they're absolutely needed. You do need lower execution characters and more straightforward characters. It's extremely important that those are in the game because you have a bunch of casual players, you have a bunch of people who don't want to spend three years in training mode to learn Monat, you know, kind of thing. That's that's crap. Like, that's not fun for a lot of people. And if you don't have these, these more, you know, straightforward characters, like, it, it just ruins your game. But what you don't want is you don't want those characters to be too high end because, again, history just shows that large parts of the community will just go over to these characters and not mess with anyone else because it's like, why would I, right? And these games are heavily based on DLC in this day and age. And you want people to actually pick up and play uh, these new fighters once you release them. And if there's a launch roster character that you can do as well or better with than the DLC fighters with less effort, why would you not pick that character? Like, history shows people want the easiest and cheapest stuff. Right. Like that's just the way it is. And and so you have to make sure all this stuff is, is factored in when you're releasing these characters and that you just don't have these these brain dead characters that are dominating the game. And brain dead is a heavy word. My apologies. I, there's some salt here because I play very technical characters. Uh, in this stupid version. idiot characters <laughs> for dumb, <laughs> stupid people. I got to. <laughs> Uh, please uh, uh, tell your friends about the event hubs podcast <laughs> like the video <laughs> uh, but yeah it, it, there's some salt here you know but again i when i get my ass handed to me by a high-end cami player or bison like i know 
that they outplayed me. You know, it's, it's not just because of their character. It's like, look, but the, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, the overall experience. I'm not just talking about my experiences and stuff with this. It's like, like, look, you know, we want these games to be better and we realize that this is a sore thumb. So let's let's finally address this more head on and actively talk about, you know, the, the how complex these characters are to play versus how good they are. Yeah. You know, and and especially in the realm of esports, which is a big thing, and and appreciating high level fighting games, and in this case, probably Street Fighter, the thing that people go to watch, the reason why people sit in the audiences of things like the Olympics, or in this case, you know, maybe Evo or Capcom Cup, is to see people um, having refined their abilities and pushed pushed beyond the limits of what we feel like might be possible. So when you have a character like you know, something super simple like Cami doing a dive kick or something like that, and most of the work being done for them versus uh, a character that has to hit confirm and plays based on that. So I, I go to Karen and I know that she's somewhat controversial, but I think she's a kind of character that deserves to be top tier um, because of the things that she's relying on. It's like her tools are really good, but not anyone can just do them. And if anyone can just do them, then then she's no longer in that category. She needs to be right there on the cusp of what people can do. And then if someone has put in the effort and refined their, their abilities to the point where they are playing at that level and they are pushing beyond and they're like setting the new record or they're doing amazing things like we've seen Daigo do, for instance, over the years, that's where we sit and we go, that's amazing. And you want to mm -hmm. set your game up to be something where pro players can do that where they can go and they can push just beyond the limits of what we feel may or may not be possible and where we are wowed and we go yeah, i can't do that or i can't do that without a ton of effort and work and i can see their effort and work manifest beautifully in front of me on this big screen where i see the likes of idom or punk or whomever doing these things that not everyone can do it's like set your game up so that those kind of things are possible and um and so like if your best characters are the ones that operate in that way well the best players in the world are going to put in the time you're going to put in the effort and they're going to show you how amazing and 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 um wowing your game can be on that level versus like you don't want a capcom cup with 30 rashids in there just doing the routine you know dial it in whatever and and then there you go so yeah, for the for the amazement factor, for the wow factor, for the reason we sit and we watch the top levels of anything, especially physical, but mental, whatever it is, it's like if you don't have a balance here, if you don't have more technical execution necessary characters at your forefront as your top tiers, you're not gonna you're gonna shoot yourself in the foot and not let yourself be that as a as a game, as a company. Yeah. It's um and John, I, I really take issue with you saying thirty Rashids at a Capcom Cup. It's not like we'd ever see six Rashids at a Capcom Cup. 